All right, here we are, Exodus uh, for Beginners. Uh, we're on lesson number six in this series. Title of this lesson is Deliverance, uh, part two. Subtitle, The Miracle Staff and the 10 Plagues. Uh, don't have time to do all the 10 plagues in a, a single lesson, so this is part one, and then we'll finish up next week as far as the plagues are concerned. So Moses and Aaron have already uh, faced uh, Pharaoh uh, once and their appeal to let the people off for three days to worship their God was not only rejected, uh, but the uh, Pharaoh uh, loaded an even heavier burden of work on the Israelites claiming their desire to have time off for a religious festival it was actually a sign of uh, laziness and they had uh, too much idle time on their hands. Uh, of course, uh, the truth was that the Pharaoh was afraid of the potential power of such a large number of foreigners in his country. And the, uh, the only way to undermine their power was to keep them occupied with forced labor that served to build up the state. Their mud bricks uh, built the city of Ramses, you see there in the map uh, up in the north west part, uh, which was a, a store city. It was a place where they, uh, uh, you know, like a depot for uh, supplies. And uh, the place from which uh, the Israelites eventually departed on their journey. We read about that in Exodus chapter 12. So in Exodus uh, chapter seven, eight to 13, God renews his call for them to once again, go to the Pharaoh to make their request, but this time they will begin to reveal the power of the God they serve and who is the one who is actually making the demand, not, not Moses actually making the demand or Aaron, but the God that uh, Moses uh, and the Israelites serve. So uh, God once again rouses Moses and Aaron in order to send them to the Pharaoh, but this time, as I said, with a difference. So let's read Exodus chapter seven, verses eight and nine. It says, now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So I want you to note that God is using the arrangement previously made. He will instruct Moses and Moses will direct Aaron as to what he will say and do. In this case, to perform a miracle with his staff, turning it into a snake on demand, if you wish. So we keep reading in chapter seven. It says, so Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh and thus they did just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. For each one threw down his staff and they turned into serpents but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. So we assume that the same request is made and Aaron performs the miracle with the staff to confirm that this is a message from God. Now to Moses and Aaron's surprise, the Pharaoh duplicates the appearance of the miracle through his magicians. For Pharaoh, who considers himself a god and his magicians part of his divine authority, Moses is no more than the Jewish version of himself with Aaron as a magician in service you know, to, to Moses. And so this is a contest in his mind to see who has the more powerful mojo. You know, uh, Pharaoh had said, work a miracle uh, in today's vernacular. Go ahead, show me something. Right? For him, it's a contest. And so when Aaron's snake eats up the snakes produced by the Egyptians, the Pharaoh is nonplussed and he dismisses them, calling it a draw in his mind. So what? You know, his, you know, one, they had one extra trick uh, more than 
the, my magicians, is not impressed. The passage uh, says his heart was hardened or in the Hebrew, his heart was strong, which could mean proud. His, his heart was proud. In other words, the attitude that says, you know, no slave is going to come into my palace and make demands on me. Doesn't he know who I am? He's still at the point where, uh, you know, this is just a contest. Uh, he is God and these people claim that uh, they have a God and uh, we're going to find out who's the more powerful God. And so God knew in advance uh, how the Pharaoh would react, but Moses and Aaron, uh, they didn't know, and they needed to get an idea of how stubborn and proud this man was. So his second interaction with him really opened their eyes. It is at this point that God will inflict great punishment on the Pharaoh and damage on the nation of Egypt in order to pressure this king to release the Jewish uh, people. Uh, there are a total of 10 plagues uh, recorded as a result of Moses and Aaron's visits uh, to the Pharaoh uh, until he releases them. Each miracle or plague has si uh, similar features that can be used as headings in a chart that you will find in your workbooks. All right, so we're going to go through these plagues, but we'll do it in an organized way. And uh, each of them have uh, similar uh, features. And uh, this is a sample here you see on the overhead. Uh, this is a, um, a sample of those features. There's the plague itself, the intensity, meaning how, uh, uh, how the plague impacted uh, the Egyptians and their country. Uh, another heading is the gods of Egypt. Each plague was designed to attack a particular deity in the Egyptian pantheon of gods to demonstrate that the God of the Jews was more powerful than uh, all of the gods of the Egyptians. Uh, some notes, you know, uh, features of each plague and the response of the Pharaoh, how he responded to each one of the plagues. So all of these, you know, uh, uh, all of these things that we see in our chart, uh, we'll be able to recognize uh, in, each, uh, in each plague. And you have in your workbooks, uh, this uh, blank chart so that you can fill them in uh, as we go. So let's, let's go through the, um, uh, the plagues. The first one is uh, uh, plague number one, water uh, to blood, water to blood. Uh, let's uh, read first in uh, chapter seven, beginning in verse 14. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water and station yourselves to meet him on the bank of the Nile. And you shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. You shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand and it will be turned to blood. Uh, the fish that are in the Nile will die and the Nile will become foul and the Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams and over their pools and over all their reservoirs of water that they may become blood. And there will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded. And he lift, uh, lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish that were in the Nile died and the Nile became foul so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And the blood was through all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts and Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them 
as the Lord said. There's another one here. It says, then Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the Nile. Seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Now, I want you to note that this plague was not accompanied with a request to release the people, uh, but rather because the Pharaoh had not listened to God's instructions so far. You know, verse 16, it says, you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. And so we look at the chart uh, to, um, you know, to, to, to see the impact here. The plague itself was water turned to blood. The intensity, it was a warning, right? It was a warning. It was, it was real, but it was limited. Uh, it was symbolic of future disaster. In other words, boy, if, 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 if the God of the Jews can do this, imagine what else he can do. As far as the gods of Egypt are concerned, Kum, the guardian of the river's source, and Happy, the spirit of the Nile and the spirit of the flooding, because the flooding each year was important, right? It brought in, you know, it cast dirt on the either side of the Nile, it, it watered the crops and so on and so forth. So Happy was the spirit of the flooding each year. Uh, we note that it was duplicated by magicians and it occurred in Goshen where the Jews lived. And of course the response, the Pharaoh just you know, shrugs off the event. Here is a depiction of uh, the Egyptian gods, uh, Kum and, uh, and uh, Happy. Um, so the final verse indicates that uh, this plague lasted seven days. So it was, it was quite an impact on the country, but it was a limited impact. It was a warning, if you wish. The second plague, the frogs, the frogs over the land. Let's read a part of that. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. The Nile was swarmed with frogs, which will come up and go into your house and into your bedrooms and onto your bed and into the houses of your servants and on your people and into your ovens and into your kneading bowls. So the frogs will come up on you and your people and all your servants. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the streams and over the pools and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. The magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So we see here the impact of this, the plague, the frog, the intensity, um, the emotional disgust for the Egyptians. You know, it was just nasty. I mean, their lives weren't in danger or anything like that, but it was nasty. Imagine frogs everywhere. As far as the gods of Egypt, uh, Hecate, uh, the frog headed goddess, uh, she was the goddess of birth and f fertility. Uh, this plague was aimed at that particular uh, uh, deity. Uh, we know again, the same uh, was duplicated by the magicians of Egypt. And uh, also this occurred in Goshen where the uh, Jews lived and the response of the Pharaoh, uh, he, was, uh, he was disturbed uh, and he lies in order to you know, get relief. Uh, we note, uh, oh, let me show you a picture. There's a, a picture of Hecate, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the god, uh, the goddess uh, of birth and, um, and fertility. Uh, we note the disbelief of the Pharaoh in, in that he casually lied to Moses to get rid of the frogs, which demonstrated that he still disregarded Moses' God as inferior to himself. You know, he'd say anything, all right, I promise it'll be okay, I'll let you go. You know, uh, you just get rid of the frogs, you know. A casual lie, simply, uh, for him, the game was still on. 
uh, he's still not uh, impressed to the point where he's ready to uh, obey. Plague number three, uh, lice and mosquitoes in Exodus chapter eight, verses 16 to 19, read that. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth that it may become gnats through all the land of Egypt. They did so and Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats through all uh, the uh, land of uh, Egypt. The magicians tried with their secret arts to bring forth gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. So we see here uh, our chart, lice or mosquitoes, um, emotional, an emotional impact on the people, physical discomfort. Again, lives were not in danger here, but again, it was the, the disgust factor uh, that was uh, you know, impacting the population. Uh, the particular God uh, that this represented was Seb, who is the earth God of Egypt. He was the God of the dead and the God of the earth in which the dead are buried and from which uh, these insects came from. Um, we note that the, uh, this particular plague could not be duplicated by the magicians. This is where they fall off, you know. So far they've kept up, but they, no way that they can make and duplicate this uh, through their magic arts. Again, it occurs in Goshen and the magicians themselves attribute this plague to the finger of God and they tell the Pharaoh uh, that this is what they believe. After all, they're his counselors. But Pharaoh refuses to listen even to his own counselors uh, advice as far as this is concerned. Here's a, a picture of Seb. That was the, the God, the earth God of, uh, of Egypt. I want you to note, as I said before, that the magicians themselves are convinced and they tell the Pharaoh that this is God. This is the finger of God. This isn't magic, which is at work. And uh, yet stubborn as he is, he doesn't even listen to his own uh, counselors. The next plague flies in Exodus chapter eight, verses 20 to 22. It says, now the Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you do not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and on your servants and on your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of flies and also the ground on which they dwell. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people are living so that no swarms of flies will be there in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. And so when we look at the chart this time, uh, we see, of course, the plague of the flies, the intensity, again, a continued emotional and physical discomfort for the Egyptians, not only frogs and lice, but now flies. Uh, various gods here, uh, Vachet, the fly god of Egypt, uh, the god that guards all life in the Delta region. It was a female goddess. She was the lady of the marshes where the papyrus uh, grew and uh, where many insects uh, lived. Uh, this, was the, this was the goddess that was uh, the target of this particular plague. Yeah. We note that God separates the Israelites and the Egyptians. Up until this point, the uh, Jews living in Goshen were suffering the same you know, effect of the plagues as the Egyptians. You know, the frogs were with, you know, with them too. The, the lice and the, uh, the mosquitoes, you know, they had to suffer uh, that as well. But at this point, uh, when, when God brings the plague of the flies, uh, he separates. Uh, the, the, the plagues will no longer affect the Israelites. And he calls it, he tells them from now on, you know, uh, the plagues will not affect my people, just your people. 
Uh, and we read on, if we had the time to read all of the, you know, all the passages, we learn that the Pharaoh, again, deceitfully negotiates with uh, Moses, uh, offering a you know, false promise uh, in order to get rid of the, uh, of the uh, flies. Um, uh, I, I want you to note a very important uh, idea that God begins to make a distinction between his people and the Egyptians, which make the miraculous plagues truly a judgment upon the Pharaoh and his people. It's personal now. It's Moses' God versus Pharaoh and his God. Because Moses could have said, well, look, everybody's being affected, even the Jews, you know, so you know, eventually uh, you know, this guy Moses is going to run out of tricks. But now, you know, by saying, by, you know, by focusing the plagues on just one group of people, God is uh, you know, sort of upping the ante here, demonstrating his power uh, and challenging the magicians and the gods of the Egyptians to see if they can match what he can do. Because now uh, the plagues are going to affect only one group of people. Uh, they all live in the same land, but only one group of people will be affected from now on. So that's an important, uh, that's an important distinction that we need to, to um, uh, realize. All right, uh, there's a picture of Vashit, uh, the, uh, the goddess of the, uh, of the uh, marshes. And we move on to plague number five, the livestock um, in chapter nine, uh, verses uh, uh, one to seven. I think I'll show you the chart here. The plague uh, is against the livestock, the intensity, the killing of the uh, uh, livestock. Um, the intensity is the economic loss uh, suffered by the Egyptians and the physical affliction. The uh, gods of Egypt in this are Nevis, Ammon, and Hathor. Uh, these were Egyptian gods associated with bulls and cows, primarily the idea of fertility. This plague affected the property uh, and the wealth uh, of Egypt, uh, the death of livestock. Now it's, it's not just disgust, it's not just discomfort, but now their livestock, their property is being killed and taken away from them. And of course, we would note that the response of the Pharaoh here is that he hardens his heart, but he wants to see if Jews are unscathed. And so, uh, he, you know, uh, he, he, he verifies and he realizes that God, you know, was not making an empty promise. Uh, the Jews, their cattle, their livestock was fine. It was only the livestock of the Egyptians uh, that, were, uh, that were killed. All right, there, there are the pictures of the, uh, the various gods, Nevis, Amon, Hathor, the various gods concerned with the, uh, with the livestock. Um, verses nine, six, and seven, there it is. So it says, uh, the Lord did this thing on the next day and all the livestock of Egypt died, but of the livestock of the sons of Israel, not one died. Pharaoh sent and behold, there was not even one of the livestock of Israel dead but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people go. So even when Pharaoh has proof that only his people are targeted, confirming what Moses and Aaron, as well as his own priests and magicians are telling him, he remains defiant. It's not that he's unconvinced, now he's just defiant. So we move on to the next plague. Number six, the boils and the skin uh, ulcers. Exodus chapter nine, verses eight to 12, it says, then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take for yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln and let Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. And it will become fine dust over the land of Egypt and will become boils breaking out with sores on man and beast throughout all uh, the land of Egypt. So they took soot from a kiln and stood before Pharaoh and Moses threw it toward the sky and it became boils breaking out with sores on man and beast. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils for the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not listen to them just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. 
So we look at our chart. The plague uh, is uh, the boils. The intensity, now it's physical affliction and disfigurement. It's not the animals now that are either uh, affected or dying. It's the people themselves not being killed, but being disfigured and suffering. Uh, the gods of Egypt, uh, uh, Sekhmet, uh, the goddess of epidemics, they had, they had gods for everything. Okay. They had gods for everything. So Sekhmet was the goddess of epidemics and healing and Imhotep, who was the god of healing. The idea here is they had these boils and uh, you know, appeal to these gods uh, was, not, uh, you know, was not protecting them, was not healing them. A note also, uh, really interesting, this time the magicians are also afflicted and they're not allowed at the royal court because they have these boils, they're not allowed to come you know, in the presence of uh, the Pharaoh. So uh, up to this point, the magicians have not been affected, but starting now, they also are being uh, affected by the plagues. And one other, you know, one other result of this, one other consequence of this is that because they're not allowed to come into the presence of the Pharaoh, they can't give him advice one way or another. And so now the Pharaoh is becoming more and more uh, isolated. And his response, of course, is unyielding. He only knows one, you know, he only knows one tune, and that is to, uh, you know, to, uh, to resist. Uh, there's the Sekhmet uh, and uh, Imhotep, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the gods of, of, um, of uh, healing. So the fact that the magicians who often acted as counselors to the king were not allowed at court meant that now the Pharaoh, uh, as I mentioned, was becoming isolated. He, it was all on him. You know, he couldn't blame someone else for bad advice it was on him. He was the one who was deciding one way or another. So we move to the next plague seven, the, uh, the plague of hail. We read in Exodus chapter nine, verses uh, 13. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would then have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Still, you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. So God tells the Pharaoh that he could have destroyed the Egyptian, uh, you know, he could have wiped them out. He could have killed them in other words and wiped out the land and all the animals, uh, even himself. But instead he let them live so that they could witness his power. Their suffering, disgust and pain and inconvenience and loss and so on and so they're suffering, but he hasn't killed them. Uh, and he tells them, I haven't wiped you off the face of the earth simply for the fact uh, of, of providing a witness of my power uh, to you and of course to the nations around you because uh, you know, all these things that were happening did not happen in a vacuum. Uh, others saw what was taking place uh, in Egypt and what was uh, happening there. And so to prove that this statement is true, he sends a horrific hailstorm that causes ruinous uh, damage. So uh, let's look at our chart. The hailstorm is the uh, plague itself. The intensity, well, economic loss, uh, the loss in labor force, loss of crops, loss of livestock. The gods of Egypt, uh, Nut, uh, she was a sky goddess. Uh, Osiris, the god of agriculture, and Shu, the god of the atmosphere, of the weather. Uh, one interesting note is the historical uniqueness for such a storm in Egyptian climate. I mean, it's hot in Egypt. It's always hot in Egypt. And so to have a huge hailstorm is very unusual. 
uh, you, know, you need cold, you, know, you need a combination of heat and cold to create uh, a hailstorm, especially a hailstorm you know, that produces this kind of hail. And yet uh, they, don't, they don't have this type of uh, phenomenon, uh, weather phenomenon. Uh, in Egypt. So it was unique to even have this, okay? He could have sent rain or something like that or an earthquake, but he sent a, a, a weather phenomenon which was unique uh, that hadn't uh, been experienced. And of course the response, uh, some officials uh, we read heed the warning, uh, but the Pharaoh uh, uh, repents. Uh, and as he's done in the past, he repents in order to get relief but then he changes, uh, he changes his mind. Uh, here are the gods, Nut, uh, Osiris, and Shu, the three uh, deities uh, that this uh, storm uh, was, um, uh, was uh, aimed at. Uh, so then, uh, as I said, the, uh, the Pharaoh uh, repents. Uh, he says, okay, you know, uh, but then he changes his mind. It's, it's the same scenario over and over again. So then the next plague, number eight, are the locusts. Uh, chapter 10, verses uh, one to uh, 20. We're not gonna read all of that. We don't have uh, time for that, but we'll look at our chart. The locusts come and they, you know, they just devour the land, okay? So the intensity, well, what's the problem? Well, now it's economic loss between the hail that has you know, destroyed livestock and trees and things like that, now you have the locusts who cover the land. Well, they just eat everything in sight, right? As well as the physical affliction and the remaining crops that have survived the other plagues are destroyed. The gods of Egypt, Seth, uh, he was the deity of storms and disorder. Uh, some of the notes, background, at pleading of the officials, Pharaoh agrees to negotiate. They finally convince him, look, you, you, these people are gonna kill us uh, if you don't negotiate. There'd be nothing left of our, of our nation. Uh, his response, of course, he confesses his sin and he asks for relief, but once the relief is provided, he changes his mind once again. And this, uh, oh, let me show you a picture. There's Seth. You notice that uh, they're, they're a composite. You know, they, the, these various deities have certain features that are the same and they, they kind of change uh, in order to uh, highlight the uh, particular uh, power that they have or the particular area that they have uh, responsibility over. And so uh, we go to the ninth, uh, plague, uh, which is darkness in Exodus chapter uh, 10. Uh, let me show you the chart before we do any reading. Uh, darkness, darkness comes over the land. Uh, the intensity, uh, the intensity of it is, well, fear. Uh, it's one thing if it's dark at night, but when it, it grows dark, uh, completely dark in the middle of the day, uh, then that's ominous. Uh, the darkness actually is a symbol of death. The gods of Egypt that are targeted, Re, the sun god, uh, who was the most worshiped of all the gods other than the Pharaoh himself. You know, in Egypt, it's pretty sunny. <laughs> it's sunny and warm. And when the sun disappears in the middle of the day, it has quite an impact on the people because the sun uh, was one of the gods the most uh, noted, most worshiped among the Egyptians. Uh, it was dark in Egypt at midday, uh, but we need to remember there was light, however, available in Goshen. Where the Jews lived, the day was normal. That's a, that's a tremendous miracle, a tremendous witness. The response here is that the Pharaoh makes a concession, but he refuses to yield. And this time he furiously uh, dismisses uh, Moses. Here is a, again, a picture of Ray, um, uh, the, uh, the sun god. 
Uh, Re was one of the uh, oldest deities in Egyptian uh, history. Um, he was eventually merged with the god Horus, becoming the morning sun, later merged with the god Ahun to become the noonday sun, and then merged with the god Atum to become the evening sun. Re was associated with primal life-giving energy to control or to have the power to block out the sun at will was to demonstrate a power beyond what the Egyptians knew or could even imagine. At this sign, the Pharaoh tries to negotiate with Moses concerning who could leave and who could stay behind, but Moses repeats God's demand to release all the, all the Israelites with all their possessions. And at this point, the Pharaoh threatens Moses with death if he returns. So let's read that part in Exodus 10, 28 and 29. It says, then Pharaoh said to him, Moses, get away from me, beware, do not see my face again. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses said, you are right. I shall never see your face again. And of course, uh, we know what happens. Uh, there's one more plague and we're going to save that last plague, number 10, for our next lesson next time, because it'll involve the first step in creating a nation, the feast commemorating the Israelites' freedom uh, from slavery. And so uh, there's a lot of material there. I don't want to rush through it. So we're going to save uh, plague number 10, how it happened, what it brought about, uh, the special uh, commemorative uh, meal uh, that God uh, gave the Jews, and of course, how to prepare in order to avoid being uh, victims of that uh, plague. So I would ask you, uh, if you're following us, uh, following this class, to read, read ahead, Exodus chapter 11, verse one, to Exodus 12, verse 36. Uh, as you can tell, we don't have time in the time allotted in this class to read you know, all of the passages uh, that we're discussing. So it helps if you've read ahead, you kind of know, and I read intermittent uh, passages here simply to emphasize the point. At the same time, uh, you're able to fill in your chart, you know, put in more information if you need to do that. Uh, and uh, you will find that, of course, in the uh, workbook, which I've mentioned before, you can download uh, from our website, or if you'd like to just have the book and not mess with that, you can always order it on Amazon and uh, they will be happy to deliver that to you. Okay, so there's our uh, lesson number six, uh, going over the first nine plagues. Uh, we'll do plague number 10 next time. God bless you, thank you for your attention.